next week's presenter is in the room. Where is he? There he is. Over there. And it would be Phil Rylett, How to Be Fluent in Spanish in 40 Minutes. Yeah. Right after that, he's going to go on a 21-day water fast. I don't know why. As, as it says, most of us would like to be able to speak Spanish, but many consider it too daunting. New research in second language learning has revealed something quite surprising. You can learn a language by using a language. <laughs> oh, although this sounds a little paradoxical, using a language you don't know to learn the language, it works. And it's more fun than learning grammar rules. Phil Rylett, who's now standing by the door ready to leave, started teaching English as a second language after retiring as a systems analyst. Doesn't say that you were also a nurse. Anyhow, he discovered the traits of the su successful language learner from observing his students, and he began to realize true communication does not come out of a book. Phil has lived in Ahihik for four years, and though he arrived with only rudimentary Spanish, he has trained youth soccer teams here and has participated and many other traditional village activities. As is our custom, we will now have a moment of meditation, and this is led by Janet Riker. Good morning. So, if you choose, Close your eyes, or have them open with a soft gaze if that's more comfortable. And just take a moment to reflect on the fact that you are here. If your body is here, your thoughts may be elsewhere. But for just these next few minutes, try to have them both in the same place your mind, and your body. Bring your attention to the fact that you're sitting. Noticing sensations in your body. Noticing that you're breathing. Many find it helpful to use the breath to hold the attention there, noticing the sensations of breathing rather than the thought of breath. The physical sensation of breathing is always with us. That first in-breath begins our cycle here on this earth. accompanied by sensation. Wherever you feel it in your body, just be with that sensation. Notice there's a pause between the in-breath and the out-breath. Let your attention be with the sensation of the out-breath. Each of those has a beginning, a middle, and an end, as does the in-breath. We're just resting there for this next little bit of time. Thoughts will come. Remember your intention to be noticing the sensations of breath and gently return to that.
slowly returning, opening your eyes, and taking in all the wonder of this day. Thank you so much. Our talk today is entitled Water Governance in Mexico. Managing Scarcity, presented by Luis Enrique Ramos. He is the local attorney at law and notario público who has worked here for the last 17 years in water-related projects as an independent consultant at all three levels of government, as well as for not-for-profit and international organizations. His primary legal expertise lies in water governance, aligning the interest in resolving conflicts among stakeholders in the water sector. Luis will speak about what is happening with water policy in Mexico, what is being done to address problems of water pollution, scarcity, and usage, as well as projects to clean the water of rivers and lakes in Mexico, specifically in Lake Chapala. He will address governmental policy with regard to big infrastructure projects and issues related to the human right to water and how to implement better policy for both surface and underground water in Mexico. And he's, uh, for many of us, he's a leader in so many other social justice causes, although he wouldn't say it himself. And I know him as my personal attorney and notary public, so it's pretty good. All right, here he is. Okay. Uh, Welcome to his wife as well. Where is she? Margarita. And your one child who's over here? What's his name? Mauro. All right. Mauro. Something like that. Anyhow, here. Can you hear me well? Okay, when I was a child. Yes? Can you hear me well? Over there? Over there, can you hear me well? Yes, okay. When I was a child, I remember coming to Lake Chapala, and uh, I used to play with crabs that were very often there in the lake, and we saw a lot of frogs as well, and we ate this particular type of fish, which is a white fish, which is no longer in the lake. And later on, while I was progressing in life and, uh, and uh, maturing, I said, why don't we have these elements? And we have lost even the consciousness that we had them. And I believe since then that the first issue that we need to bring, yeah, the first issue that we need to bring here is consciousness about the importance of this lake as one of the main elements of um, a natural reservoirs of Mexico. So I will start speaking about first what the lake means and what the, it will entail for the watershed. I'm going to start uh, telling you about some of the characteristics of Lake Chapala, some of the main problems and challenges that we have, and then I'm going to try to go upward in water governance and policy, what's happening over there, what's the legal grounding, why do, don't things happen, and why do things happen. So if we understand that, I believe that we're going to be able to really take steps toward the conservation of this water body and the watershed as a whole, okay? So the first I'm going to tell you this, and then I'm going to tell you the five or six main challenges in water policy in Mexico. And then I'm going to end with some invitation of what, what we all can do here locally to uh, take steps forward with local government as well as with state government for this purpose. All right? So first of all, I, many of you have lived here for a couple of years, but it's important that you, that you know that Lake Chapala is part of the main watersheds of Mexico. We have two main watersheds. One of them is Lerma Chapala, which is, uh, it, of course, it starts nearby Mexico City. It starts uh, nearby the city of Toluca in the, in the small town of Lerma. And it came because there was a whole uh, set of wetlands that were dried out in, uh, 
in the beginning of the 20th century by the Porfirian regime because they considered them to be just uh, places that will only create mosquitoes and just create disease. So we lost uh, most of those wetlands, yet it's so strong and so powerful that uh, the water that we have there, here in, in Chapala, comes all the way from there in the state of Mexico. It crosses five states. It starts in the state of Mexico, and then it goes to Querétaro, where we have an, an important industrial production over there. One of the main transnational uh, corporations are there, in like Kimberly Clark, just to put an example. And then it, it comes, there we had some type of industrial pollution. So the problem there is pollution in Querétaro. And then it comes to Guanajuato, a nearby state. Many of you have been in Guanajuato and San Miguel de Allende, etc. And they are the main uh, producers of agricultural pro uh, production, like strawberries and many other uh, hortalites. I don't know how to say it in English, for, for this matter. So they, uh, and they export a lot. They are the main water users. They take, and, and I will speak about it, 76% of all water in Mexico in general terms is used by agriculture. So when we deal with water, it's very important that we acknowledge that we need to, to, to set into this conflict of food and water. How do we balance this both needs, okay? Then it, it flows to Michoacán, and in Michoacán, there's the production, they have a lot of pig farms, among others, and they have an important leather production. To produce leather, they use a lot of chemicals, and those chemicals are often uh, uh, thrown to the river, that, and, and they are highly pollutant. So Michoacán, again, is pollution, while uh, in, in uh, Guanajuato is more the use of the water. And then it comes to Lake Chapala, and then this watershed ends, and as you know, uh, it comes, the water comes out, and then the river is not called Lerma anymore. The river is called Rio Santiago. River Santiago, and it flows all the way into Guadalajara, and then it, it uh, follows the line all the way to Nayarit, and it ends with its delta in the Pacific Ocean. From here to Guadalajara, the main problem is that we have the industrial zone in front of the airport, and there are heavy pollutants of, uh, of the river Santiago. I'm, I'm going to tell you this, I'm going to tell you what's uh, been done to replenish that, because there are some good news uh, as well, and it's important always to balance, okay? The main element when we speak of water is that it's a complex problem. It has many variants that we need to solve. So it has a political side, it has a legal side, it has an economic side, and of course we have to take care of the social element as well, and the environmental. So, we cannot just solve the problem with only one of them. One of the main problems is that many of our authorities are still in, the, in an old paradigm where they believe that everything is solved with technology. So it's just a build a water treatment plant. Nobody really uh, gets to see if it's going to work or not, if it's uh, convenient for that municipality or not. But they believe strongly in that paradigm of technology. And we, in, in this new era, we believe that you have to look at the water problems in an integral way. So I'm going to deal with it. Every time we speak of water, there is not just black and white, it's complexity that we need to take in consideration, okay? Lake Chapala is one of the, it is the biggest lake of Mexico, so just for you to know, it's the second largest lake in, in uh, or the third in, in the whole of Latin America, and it's the second one in altitude. In, uh, only follow the only Lake Titicaca. It's a, it has a, a higher altitude than, than Lake Chapala. So this is important. It, uh, it's uh, four times bigger than the next lake of Mexico, which is Lake Huitzeo. When you go all the way to Mexico City, and if you have driven, you see Lake Huitzeo on the road, and it's four times bigger than, than Lake Huitzeo, and ten times bigger of the third lake, which is Lake Pátzcuaro. So we need to acknowledge this that for, for terms of Mexico, is the immensity of this lake, okay? Uh, it produces, it holds the whole watershed from Lerma to Chapala, holds for 3% of the population of, uh, of uh, Mexico, but it accounts for 35 cents of, of 100 cents that are produced in industrial production. Mm. So you can imagine that 35% of, uh, of that, it means a lot of pressure for the water, but it means also a lot of economic development. So this is a second clash that we need to take into consideration. 
how do you provide economic development with environmental conservation? Because we need to find a way to, to, to have it in balance. And this is the second imbalance that I wanted to, to highlight. Uh, other than that, it has, uh, right now, Lake Chapala has a capacity of around 54% of what it should have in, 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 the, in the total uh, maximum possibility. We're never going to reach 100%. When you look at the, uh, at the way the government measures the, the water, they invented a, a, a term, a technical term called COTA, and you will see that it's, uh, we're in COTA 94. Say, okay, COTA 94, what's that? If, uh, then the maximum level that the lake can get is COTA 97. So it's very confusing <laughs> if you look at it from the technical perspective, because it means the total of water, okay? So that's, uh, that's something, whenever you look at documents, you're going to see this word COTA, C-O-T-A, and that's a word the government uh, measures uh, this matter. For, uh, but it's, uh, it's something that was created for that purpose. The main uh, situation is that uh, it has a vulnerability, that it has a lot of pressure from different areas. The last pressure that we have is that the lake provides 60% of the water that's used in Guadalajara. And this is a, a, a tremendous pressure as well. Whenever you deal with a, with a conflict uh, of water for Lake Chapala, Jalisco government usually sees it in terms of this is our water, Jalisco water. And then you speak to the people in Guanajuato and they say, yeah, oh, you hypocrites, you are only uh, wanting the water to the city. You're telling me that you have an environmental purpose, but that's not true. And it is partially true. That, Guanajuato, they say, we are producing the food. If we do not provide, uh, provide that food, you're going to be, we're not going to have sufficient food, nor economic wealth in, in the whole of the country. So this uh, is another element that we need to take into consideration. As you know, there is a pipeline going to Guadalajara. I think since 1956, they're extra extracting water for Guadalajara. There are major concerns at the moment because the, the Jalisco government is... Uh, it's uh, managing for the building of a second pipe pipeline to go to Guadalajara, and this raises a lot of issues because from the environmental and social perspective, and especially the people living here at Lakeside, we say, oof, they're going to take more water than they should take, and that's going to create even more vulnerability for the lake, okay? Yet, uh, it, has a, it has an element from the technical perspective from the government that they claim that, that the, the pipeline that was built in 1956 was a pipeline that has a, whole, a lot of uh, losses and that they need to build a new pipeline so that they can repair the other one or close it. So there is, but there is a lot of distrust that this would be an element that would be true. And you have both sides. Once again, it, whenever we consume water, not only in Mexico, but particularly in Mexico, we, we have this, uh, this element, okay? So we're gonna we're gonna step into this uh, type of matters a little bit later. I'm gonna tell you two uh, particular problems. A problem that's happening in Ponce Plan, with a lot of people having kidney problems. It's a very specific problem. And I'm gonna tell you a, another project that we are starting to do in a, in a river that provides five percent of, uh, of the water for Lake Chapala, which is called Rio La Pasión, River Passion. And we're starting a project to uh, help bring knowledge and capacity so that the municipalities that are throwing their waters to the river that, uh, that it comes to Lake Chapala so that we know that, uh, that, uh, that we uh, at least we take care that that 5% is no longer polluting the lake. Okay? Now I'm going to go and tell you a little bit of the specificities of what's happening in water in Mexico. We have an, an unbalance in terms of water availability. And we have a what we call the 80-20 paradox, which means that we have 80% of the population lives from the center to the north, where we only have 20% of water availability. While from the center to the south, we, we have 80% uh, of water availability and only 20% of people living there. So whenever we deal with water management, we need to know that this is, this is creating a conflict. Why? Because now, one of the biggest social conflicts in water is the government's policy is to divert water from the watersheds that they have an excedent of water to other watersheds. And we have three main conflicts at the moment. 
One of them is in Jalisco, because there is a river coming from Zacatecas, which is called Rio Verde, or Green River, that uh, in the 90s, the Jalisco government and, and Guanajuato's government made an agreement that most of that water was going to be diverted to the city of Leon. And uh, they were going to build a dam, which is called the Zapotillo Dam, and it has created such a <coughs> social turmoil that they have not been able to complete the, the dam. Okay, so this is the first one. The other two are up north. One is in Sonora. They wanting to take water from the, the rivers uh, in, in the coastal areas from Sonora, Rio Yaqui and Rio Mayo, and they want to take it to Hermosillo, the city that's drying up because they don't have water, sufficient water. And the third conflict is in, on the eastern, northeastern part. They want to bring water from Tamaulipas. Tamaulipas is a bordering state with Texas, all the way over there. And then they want to bring water to Monterrey in a project called Monterrey Safe. So there is a lot of uh, hassle. If, if it's uh, viable, if it's not viable, the projects are multi-million uh, dollar projects. And, uh, and this is, it raises an issue if it's uh, really sustainable to just keep on attending demand or if some other measures need to be taken into consideration, okay? I have spoken that agriculture takes 76% of the water uses. The next is public supply, urban public supply. It takes 14%. And in those industry, takes maximum of 6 to 8%. So you see, uh, uh, yet in terms of economic growth, industry is the one that will sustain the, the next future. Yet, in many areas, we don't have water availability anymore. Okay? So, so now, now that you, um, uh, I have told you these facts, I want to just step over how does the legal system work here in Mexico in, and in terms of public policy. We have a, uh, in Mexico water, other than in the U.S., but I know that in the U.S. you don't have a federal law, you have different state laws and they have a very various range to deal with, uh, with water. You look at Texas or California, it's a totally different way to conceive water. In Mexico, at least that's an advantage. That we, in Mexico, the water is ruled on a federal level. We have only one law that deals with the, with the water, many peripheral laws, which is a law for national water. And, and, and water is considered as a national resource of public interest. And it has to be managed sustainable. Of course, that the written law, we would have to really attend that in, in practice, there are many non-fulfillment of the law, and this is one of the elements that we need to curtail, okay? But in principle, water is a public, it's a public domain, and it would be the federal authority, the one in charge of uh, dealing with water. And usually, this federal authority, we have a, a national water authority called CONALWA, which is, it would be that term, National Water Authority. And they deal with most of the facts that happen in terms of control of water. That's why when you get a, a, a pollution here, it, the state government, they cannot step in in terms of uh, on grounds of water. They could step in in terms of environmental grounds, but not in terms of controlling water or, or the water pipelines, etc. It would have to be the federal authority that steps in. What happens? And Conagua has to deal with at least five things. And this is important for you that you're living here because some of them have to do with you. Number one, they deal with some water. Number two, they have to deal with underground wires, which have a very different approach. Number three, they deal with what's called uh, the federal zone. And the federal zone is the zone adjacent from the water body to the inland area. So for instance, if uh, here Lake Front, you have to respect 20 meters from the maximum height that the water can come up to the, to the next place. Naturally, since Lake Chapala comes like this in terms of the water, it's difficult to really know, and that there are many holes in the, in the way that they have measured. So you see some houses that have stepped in in what clearly is an invasion of the federal zone. In the federal zone, you cannot build uh, hard structures, just a palapa, and, uh, and, and something that would be only considered provisional. In the rivers, because some of you would be, if you see all the, all the creeks, coming down from the mountains, now that we're stepping into the rainy season, you will see that if the river is uh, wider than 10 meters, the federal zone is 10 meters on each side that you need to respect for repairing vegetation and so that uh, there is no erosion in the, in the water bank, okay? If the creek is less than 10 meters, 
then you only have to respect five meters. But even here, we see that there is a lot of invasions. The most clear invasion that you have, if you have been to the Little Lakeside Theater, that street coming down, uh, you'll see it in the rainy season. The water recognizes its cause, uh, its, uh, its, its main uh, way, and it always creates trouble bringing stones and bringing many elements because it was not respected at that time. So we believe that one of the main policies is as well, how do you do it so that you have proper control? So now that you know that most of it is federal authority, you need to uh, uh, get to know that Conagua, for the watershed, well, Conagua is, is a central institution in Mexico City and is divided in 13 different uh, water authorities at a regional level. Supposedly, they are supposed to work with a watershed vision. In practice, it does not happen often. The authority for the re our uh, watershed is located in Guadalajara, and they have to deal with issues in Querétaro and Toluca, but they're based here. They only have from 14 to 18 inspectors for the whole watershed. And so you can imagine that they need to deal with these five different uh, acts because the other elements that they control are the extraction of sand and rocks, which are, are of an important economic value from the water bed. And if people are taking those, then they will be creating diversions in the river and they create a lot of hassle and problems there. So knowing that they have very little uh, uh, inspectors and that it, the state has been shrinking and shrinking and shrinking since the 80s, then that means that every time a Conagua uh, functionary or employee retires, they do not hire somebody else. They simply close the position. So this means that we have less people doing more things. In common sense, we really need to find, and this is why we're pushing to tell them we need to shift the paradigm of your exclusive authority and you need to start delegating in some other way so that at state level, which are, uh, these authorities are closer to, the, to, the, to their own water problems, and, uh, that they can step in, and you need to give more authority to water users and to civil society. How do we find a way there to, to really make, make it happen? And there is a way legally to, to make that happen because the law of, of uh, 1992 for, for the federal law for water, they give the possibility to build water, what are called river basin councils or water shed councils. And these are collaborative uh, platforms where government uh, uh, composed 50% of these platforms and civil society together with water users, the other 50%, okay? So at least there is a parity there. there is a, they, they come together, yet they have been lacking uh, of a real political power because they do not have teeth. They, they can only advise, they can only uh, uh, just uh, gather together uh, to produce some studies, etc. But they are, it's not compulsory that they are taking into consideration. One of the basic propositions that we are, many of us are pushing there is so, so that we give more teeth to these councils, so even where, precisely where Conagua is lacking control, inspection, so that they know, control of wells, inventory of resources, how do you do it? Who else is going to be more interested? If you see that your neighbor is having a well, it's definitely going to impact whatever you, it's happening in your property. So give more power to these water users organizations. It's not easy, because that means losing power, and it's a power struggle. Like in, like in every other place, okay? But yet, it's present. We are pushing so that there will be a control of well. At the moment, anybody can drill a well, any company, and they, uh, they are not registered with the government or anything. So I believe that uh, we should have a registry control. In some countries in South Africa, like Namibia or Zimbabwe, they have included that in, the, in, their, in their water legislation, which means that you cannot simply drill a well. You have to be a registered and licensed uh, well driller, uh, and, and then you have to report all the elements of the well so that you can provide for issues of security of what's happening with the wells. Okay? So we're pushing there in, in that uh, in that uh, area. I so that's basically the, the first uh, step that I wanted to tell you on the watershed council. Now I'm, I'm going to step to the third element, which would be uh, the main problems that we have here and all the challenges that we are facing at the moment. The first that I see as a, as a main problem 
is sanitation and control of pollution. Part of sanitation means sanitation uh, is the, the, when you get a policy to clean the waters that you produce that waste the waters. At the moment, we are only uh, uh, reducing 13% of the waste waters that we are uh, using as first, uh, first use waters. So we need to shift the policy in terms of what we're doing so that we incentive the use of uh, waste water, recycled waste water, especially in some, uh, in some parts of the industrial processes, like uh, cleaning of tanks. Why do you use uh, first, water, first uh, use water for cleaning of tanks? You could, uh, yeah, you could use recycled water. And a very good example, because that's good news, Monterrey Public Works uh, in, in the city of Monterrey they have been very clever in the way that they have conceived this because they, they are in uh, black numbers for the, on, on their economic situation because they would charge you the water, they would charge you for uh, putting the water into the, into the system and then they would charge you to clean the water and they will resell it to the industry so they earn four or five times. That means that they are super happy to uh, public works. This is an exception to the rule. It does happen as well in the northern cities where you have scarcity like Tijuana or Mexicali, which uh, scarcity has made that people uh, uh, really move forward to get a better management policy in this sense. Okay? In this area, I want to tell you what's happening here in Pochitlan. Does everybody know where Pochitlan is here? Yeah? So Pochitlan is on, on the other side. You cross Chapala, you go all the way to the other side, Many of you would have gone to Vista del Lago, where the golf uh, course is, and you still have to go further. It's a very scenic road. Uh, over there in Pochitlan, they have a particular culture because they, it's, it's like an indigenous people's culture. And uh, in most of the area, you, you don't even have private property. It's a community-owned land, like the indigenous community. Yet, so there is a lot of poverty as well, we have to say that. In the, late, in the last years, uh, a problem has arisen that many people are having kidney problems derived from the, from the water usage of, uh, with, with a lot of metals. They, they have found lead, they have found metals that are usually not ordinarily there. They are taking water from the, from the underground. So uh, at the moment, the government has stepped in, but yet my thinking is why does this situation, why, how did it go that we did not have a policy to prevent this type of issue. That means that we are lacking measurement. What's happening with, uh, with water policy in terms of measurement? And this is one main element that we need, and we're pushing in, in terms of uh, measuring water quality and measuring water usage. So in the next, uh, the, the sustainability of water policy in Mexico has to pass through this keyword, which will be measurement. How many of you have uh, meters in your homes? Do you have meters? No, you don't have meters, so you pay a fixed tariff. So, so this is a, this is another element. If you would uh, look at it, most of the small towns in Mexico were still lagging behind in water meters. That means that, regardless of the of the water that you use, you will pay a fixed amount. And that's also a disincentive because we are subsidizing uh, uh, water is subsidizing uh, the way that we are using it. And so it doesn't matter if you. If you keep the holes open for the whole day, you will pay exactly the same amount. Okay? So mirror is, is another element that we need to go over there. Uh, good news that we have is that uh, in the last uh, decade, Guadalajara has two new very big water treatment plants. Before those 10 years, it's, I'm, I'm ashamed to say it, but only 23% of the, the waste water was treated. The rest would go directly to the river. The second largest city. Yet, the good news is that they opened a water treatment plant in El Ahogado, it's called El Ahogado, because that's the way that watershed is called, in almost in front of the airport. And that's taking care of a part of the problem, so they would increase almost to 45, uh, only with that uh, plant. And it, it was built in a, in a very good way, I was there. So they are even, even using the biogas that's produced and, uh, to, to produce uh, methane gas from, uh, as a result of the project. So that's good news. And the second good news is on the other side of the city, they built even a larger water treatment facility, which is called Agua Prieta. And that, in, in, a, in, in a few years, is going to take care of around 87 of all wastewater produced in the, 
in Mexico, okay? So that's good news, and it's important to know they still have a lot of issues that they need to solve the pipelines to, to bring all the water to that water plant, because you need to convince industries, you need to convince some of the neighborhoods that are, that are just simply just putting a pipe to the river to, 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 to make it happen so that everything goes redirected to the water plant. And then the idea is to resell that water to the industries in El Salto. So that's a major improvement, and I, I want to say it because it's always important to have a balance in this matter. The second element there go, is overdrafting of aquifers. This, this element means that in Mexico we have, in the underground, 653 aquifers. Two main aquifers, for instance, of Guadalajara. So these are big reservoirs. It's like if you have big lakes uh, compounded in, 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 in underground. And uh, yet, in 1975, 32 of those uh, aquifers were overexploited. That means that they you pulled more water than the aquifer had the, uh, the ability to replenish. Okay? In, in, uh, in all those years, since 2016, that number of overexploited aquifers has increased to 106, which means that a sixth of the, of the total aquifers in Mexico have this problem. This is clearly to be seen in Mexico City, of course. It's clearly to be seen, especially in some northern cities or states like Chihuahua. They have a tremendous problem there, and they're really pushing hard to, to, to control the aquifers because they are very angry with Conagua. You, you are not popular if you are from the Federal Water Authority of North in Mexico. And, and it's clearly also the case in Sonora, by the coastal areas, where that, uh, that phenomenon is creating in, in saline intrusion into the aquifers which produces, makes it, makes it that, that the aquifer is no longer uh, uh, valid, uh, good for, for water consumption, okay? So we need to really uh, start uh, thinking in a, in, a, in a proper policy. And the main thing here is definitely, for this end, water user involvement and civil society involvement together with decentralization of uh, authority would make a good case for this matter in, in, in aquifer control. The third one would be agricultural production. As I told you twice, uh, uh, agriculture consumes 76% of the water in Mexico, yet it's the only use that doesn't pay any single cent for tax. Okay? Because it was a policy since, uh, since that comes from the 1930s. It was part of the Mexican Revolution that we needed to have a very strong agricultural production and we needed to enhance the peasantry. In reality, who we are enhancing at the moment is the big agro-exporters. Yeah. They, they are the ones that control mo most of the water. The normal average peasant really doesn't get much of, of water. Yet the lobbying in terms of, uh, of uh, trying to put a, a tax, even if it's a minimum tax, creates an important clash uh, when, when you go to Congress and when you, uh, especially up north, uh, but also in the, in the center of Mexico for this matter. So this is, it's fundamental and we have been pushing to have a progressive taxation of using agriculture as an incentive to increase better infrastructure for agriculture. Otherwise, you don't have an incentive. Why should I put it? Unless you give it to me for free, I will not, I will not improve the, the way I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm uh, irrigating. So that's a, that's a main element that we need to know. Even if we would save all the water at the, at the urban level, the main problem lies in agriculture. And we need to address this type of food production versus water, okay? The fourth, and I think I will end with this, because I want to go to the challenges. I don't know how I, how I would time. Okay? okay. Three minutes, okay. So I just, I'll just deal with the equality in water. Uh, usually, with uh, ur urban provision for water, it's done, uh, if there is a, a strong projection, 97%. Yet, we have very urban communities and rural communities where uh, they don't have water, and they are the ones that pay more. So we have created an inequality there. They pay like 10 times more for water because they need to, to get them from, from water tanks. When we deal in water, we also need to take into consideration the real unbalance in society in, in income generating for, for families. So we need to direct subsidies to the, to the people that really need subsidies and not subsidize who doesn't need it, okay? I'm gonna I'm gonna end to just to say that uh, coming back to the original idea of uh, 
what happened with this uh, raising of consciousness for, for uh, Lake Chapada and the watershed and for water in general terms, I believe that we can we also have a role to fulfill. For instance, I'm, I'm, uh, I would uh, suggest three main principles that we could do here at uh, Lake Side. Number one, uh, we could change the products that we're using for cleaning. The products that you're using, like, uh, I don't want to, to, to name brands, but usually they're very heavy on uh, chemicals for the underground. I would strongly suggest to have a, a, to, to shift for, for other products that would be organic, which are much better. We're working on trying to produce a technical norm to forbid this, uh, this type of chemical products and, and uh, chlorine for this matter, because they are, they are causing this type of issue. Number two, if you see, we still have to grow an environmental culture, that, uh, especially in many areas. Some of you uh, have been very kind, and they collect uh, uh, sabritas and uh, these chips uh, inventories for these matters. We are in a problem to recycle those for that matter. So that, that would be a second element. And number three, if you have the chance to build in a federal zone nearby uh, one of the chips, Please be very mindful that that's going to have an impact for the future and the future generation. And with that, I will end. I thank you very much. It's uh, all well. <laughs> Incredible. There you have, you have Pat, passionate man, clear thinking, and very ethical. Can you ask for any more in a talk or a presentation? Time, about 10 minutes for, for questions. They're not comments, please, they're questions. One of our people will come to you. Um, back here, the first person. Well, she, was first. she was first. No, he was. Oh, Ladies first. 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 Ladies first. Okay. Thank you so much. This was a terrific, terrific presentation. Um, I'm from Tucson, Arizona, which is one of the leaders in the entire nation of the United States for water management and uh, recycling of water uh, and home recycling and water catchment. We have very little rain and we're at the top of that use. One of the things that's been most uh, effective there has been real profound education at the elementary school level with the government obviously involved with that. Are you doing education in the elementary school level about water issues? Should, should I take, a, instead of answering one, if I take another one so that we can... Yeah, I, I have actually two questions. Uh -huh. The one is, all this water treatment plants that you have, why can't we take that water and dump it back into Lake Chapala? Uh -huh. okay. okay. and, and maybe uh -huh. even get a bit of a flow going through the lake. We dump it that into the lake, it would flow down to the intake, mm -hmm. and it would help the lake. The other was, I spent some time with Todd Stom mm -hmm. uh, working in water treatment. And we went down to San Pedro, which was an eye-opener for me, to say the least. Uh, they have problems down there with the kidney disease, the same as Monsterland does. And they're taking their water from wells. And the wells they're taking the water from are going down into the volcanic mm -hmm. rock, hot rock, mm -hmm. which is taking out, leaching out the lead and the arsenic, mm -hmm. bringing it back up to them and, and through their bodies and causing all these problems. I'm standing there and I'm looking at the lake. The lake is sitting right there, and they cannot pull the water from the lake because of government regulations. Mm -hmm. That is the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> you can save their lives if you can't do it for them. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go first to, to your uh, answer. I believe that uh, uh, there are formal programs, but the problem with, with Mexican education, that has to do with the, the education policy of Mexico. We tend to think in very formalistic ways. So we make manuals, guidelines. Uh, books, but they, whenever they get materialized, they get materialized in such a formal, boring way that they do not create. So we, the problem is with methods. If we would have a method that would raise questions in children, you would have a different issue. But there, there are some attempts, and you see them in the book, but they tend to become very rigid, very formal. So I would say that I would review the methodology with which uh, we are giving uh, education to the children. We need to become much more practical in these days. Children uh, have a, be, uh, a different way of uh, de dealing with abstract thinking. We need to go very practical to, to start with the problem and then from there go to, to, uh, to, to explain to them the conceptual framework and not vice versa. They are starting with the conceptual framework in that sense. 
So uh, going to this uh, equation in, uh, from quantity line, indeed, one of the main issues that we have at the moment with, uh, with drilling is that since uh, they have to drill further down and they get into volcanic uh, uh, types of waters, waters that have been there for millions of years, which are too rich in minerals. And that means that they are not good for, uh, for uh, water, for human consumption. And to take those, those elements would be very expensive. We need to find other ways of solution uh, in that sense. In, in, in the sense of what you're telling me, that they are, uh, the people in Fossil Line and San Pedro, they cannot uh, pump water. That's indeed a contradiction of the law and, and, and of the public policy. And let me tell you why. When in 1992, the, the law gave the uh, legal certainty for you to have your water right. So they gave you a certain amount of uh, cubic meters. You could have it, you have a title, and you can even consult your water rights, the status of your water rights, because we have a, a, a water rights public registry that you can consult online. But guess what? They, they made it in a principle that the first come, first serve. So if you would request water, I'll give you the water. They were very generous giving waters in the 90s and the, at the beginning of the 2000s. So that means that they over-allocated water. They gave more water rights than the, than the real existing water rights. And guess what? You need even the municipalities, if they want to, to provide water for the, for the water users, they need to get a type of grant called assignation, assignation from, from, the, uh, from the federal government. It's not that the municipality says, oh, I, I'm going to grow, then I'm, I'm going to have the, all the water that I, that I can have. No, they would have to acquire water from water users. So the main problem that we have is that we have over allocation of, uh, of water rights. That means that you cannot use the water like this. Number one. <coughs> and number two, there, is a, there are agreements done by the, the Jalisco government with Guanajuato and the other states to state the amount of water that, you can, that each state can divert. That means that Jalisco would be the first one limiting from our communities here to, to divert water for our communities because they want to secure it for the big city. So that's, a, that's the next element. So it is possible to do. Many people get very frustrated and what they do is that they start pumping without asking permission. <laughs> that, that's what happens in practice because uh, otherwise you need to go to the, to the market to acquire water rights mm. and uh, depends on the watershed that you are, it becomes very expensive. If you want to build an industry in nearby Mexico City, oof, per cubic meter, you have water rights brokers at the moment that earn a lot of money because of that, uh, that situation, okay? Um, many of us here today are expats or for foreigners and have come from very environmentally conscious states and would like to find a way to be more proactive in encouraging the Mexican government to be more proactive environmentally. And yet, as expats, some of, even though some of us are permanent or temp have permanent or temporary visas, are there restrictions on what expats, mm -hmm. the type of influence we can exert on politicians or other environmental right. government people? Thank you. Uh, the Mexican Constitution states that the only thing that you cannot do, that you, you cannot do, is step into politics, into formal politics, to try to shift power in this country. Of course, everything that we do, any social policy that we do, is politics in a way. <laughs> but, but we need to differentiate that one thing is politics and the other thing is stepping into social policy and public policy, which is two, two different issues. So yes, there is a way, and I, I would suggest that, uh, like, like the situation with Tucson, if for this matter, you could help us uh, redefine, look at the books, what, uh, how, are the, how is the government dealing with uh, educating people? And perhaps you could help us in a very concrete way, stating this is how we do it in the, in the US, this is how we teach children. And that would be very helpful because then we could translate those into our own context. And that's something very practical and feasible to do. The, the second issue that I would invite you, is we have several projects here locally, one of them is going to be Ponce Plan, of course, but the other one is uh, Rio La Pasión, which is a 22-kilometer river, very small. It only provides for 5% of the water for Lake Chapala. So it creates a perfect example to create a successful model. So we are, we are starting to work with them, three municipalities, 
It, it starts in Michoacán, in, in a town called San Jose de Gracia, and they are very proud people. They call themselves Josefinos because they are very proud. They say the state government doesn't give us anything, but we don't want them. Let them, let them stay away. They are the biggest uh, dairy producer of Michoacán and one of the biggest in the whole of Mexico. So they, uh, they are very proud of that, and they produce very nice cheeses. The cheeses that you buy here in the market sometimes come from that area. Yes, any and all of the production that they're doing, they are throwing all the waste into Rio La Pasión, which incredibly has a way to clean it, it, uh, itself, and then, but yet it's coming to Lake Chapala. So we're starting with them in a three-step pro uh, project. The first one is to have a proper water treatment facility. We're working with them in that sense. Number two, we will step in into uh, water river management. How do you measure? water quality and water quantity, how do you preserve the riparian vegetation. So uh, it's uh, slow, because uh, usually that's what happens with municipal authorities. It's slow, uh, at, at, uh, to, to say the most positive thing about it. <laughs> so you need to really, you really need to step there. So if you have any technical knowledge, I have uh, had people that uh, deal with uh, water treatment facilities, that they know how to implement methodologies for social interaction, uh, who are biologists, who uh, would be willing to give some time for uh, education, that would be fine. Good. Okay, we have, oh, no, we have a fellow over here with us. And uh, we have, we'll go over about five more minutes. If you need to leave, please leave quietly now. Thank you. Hi there, my name is Kai. Thanks for, thanks for coming and talking today. Um, I just want to follow up on what a uh, woman said earlier. Um, and sort of broaden the, the discussion. I think it's important that we realize, number one, the government's not gonna save us in this issue. It's not saving us in the United States. It's not gonna save us here. It's up to uh, each of us to, uh, to take on this issue. And I think it's important because we're a, a group of people that, with a lot of means and there's people here that wanna do good things. So uh, what I would encourage uh, everybody and ask you to speak about is what we can do locally. We pull the water, most people don't even know that our water that we use here in town comes out of the ground, doesn't come out of the situation all around the lake. Um, we're unsustainably pulling the water out of the ground here. The water table's dropped, I've heard, 200 feet in the last 10 or 20 years. Um, it's not sustainable. Uh, we're going into rainy season. We get upwards of 50 inches of rain here a year. Um, I would like, yep, I would like you to um, address the, the three issues of dry ecological toilets, why are they not being used, oh. rainwater harvesting and storage and use for, oh. for domestic purposes, and also on-site gray water systems for replenishing groundwater. And there'll be okay. two questions after that, so make it. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, the first, dry sanitation. I had the opportunity to really work on projects in dry sanitation. I believe that we need to, to, to step uh, forward. The, why are we still using uh, first water, water use to, uh, to, to put our poop, our, our shit in that sense. We need to start speaking about poop and shit in, in the proper terms. We need to bring it forward, you know? Because uh, we are... It's next week. So for the uh, an average use of, usage of water for, for a family of five is two, 250,000 liters a year. Just to dispose of our needs in that sense. So why, why are we doing that? Who, where did it come from? And if you look at the rationality that brought all these water-based uh, systems, it's really irrational. So we really need to upscale the issue of dry sanitation. It's not simple. Uh, usually, at, at this moment, here in Mexico, you would be very alternative, hippie, to be implementing your own dry toilet and then using it as a compost in the proper way. Yet, in, in other countries like Japan, even China, they are investing in research to do it on an industrial basis because I believe that there is not going to be sufficient water for the next generations to really deal with, uh, with disposing it. We need to use the water for what we really need water for, not to dispose it. And uh, that came since uh, I think the first one to use that was Louis XIV, in, uh, was the first one to clean his, uh, his butt in, 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 uh, with, with water in that sense. And then it came all the development of the toilet as the modern toilet that we know, which is highly unmodern. You told me also, well, uh, water recharge? Rain, rain ah, rainwater harvesting. In, uh, the problem with rainwater harvesting, for what I know, and I don't know the, all the, the technical details of that, is that the type of rainfall that we have in this area is limited to three months a year. 
which means, and then you get all of the water together in three months. You need to have very big reservoirs for the whole year for only three months. So it is important. I would believe that especially that would apply. Uh, we, we really need to use it. At least we could uh, we could uh, use some of it to for some uh, to water our plants, etc. I think that uh, you should be tied with uh, reusing grey waters. And there are perfect uh, projects that to separate grey grey waters from what's considered black waters. Grey waters is the waters that you use in the kitchen that you could uh, reuse for uh, to to, uh, to to have uh, you, you could have even local wetlands at home uh, that the plants take over with uh, with this type of uh, situation. Okay. And the third one would be uh, replenishing the, the aquifers. Mm -hmm. I would say that uh, if there is a policy to replenish aquifers, but uh, even with the uh, reduced wastewater, and uh, it has happened in Mexico City clearly, because they, if they don't replenish the, the aquifer, the city will go down, because it's uh, located in what, what used to be a lagoon. Uh, yet, we, uh, we're still in the first phases of development in, in replenishment of aquifers. We are dealing just for a final step with fracking, and I didn't speak about fracking, and that's a contrary policy. We'll have uh, uh, all right. this gentleman's been waiting a long time. Yes, I'm, I'm wondering, I'm, I'm Dutch, I'm from Dallas, Texas, and we collect our own rainwater off our gutters to use to water our plants. Uh, but I'm wondering, uh, uh, how is global warming affecting the weather patterns in Mexico, and how is that changing uh, your thinking on how we have to collect water in different parts of Mexico compared to what it was 10 years Okay. Okay. One question after. Okay. Do you want to? Okay. I think, but does global warming exist? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have to, so, so the main, the main element here, I think, it's a, it's fundamental that we take into consideration global warming and climate change in the new, uh, in, in the new uh, generations. For instance, we have a hat in, in two ways you can perceive it. The, the amount of hurricanes that we have and uh, the, the dryness that's happening with the uh, desertic areas. So in areas that we have more availability, we don't have the same availability now, and that's a fact. So we need to deal with scarcity. And how do you produce your policy in scarcity, whereas uh, in, uh, with regard to these uh, issues of climate change? And I must say that, at least in a conceptual framework, the government has finally stepped in into considering the climate change discourse. And it's now, in every policy, we have a federal law for climate change. And this has been a step forward because, uh, at, uh, as I say, they, they are at least acknowledging it in, in, in concept and they're considering it for future plans. So that's a good, good okay. news. We have one very quick question and one very quick answer. Hello. Um, is anyone interested in dry toilets? I have Larry's informative book called Humanure. Um, you mentioned most of the water goes to agriculture. How much goes to animal production, what they drink and what they eat, all the feed? And also, does any, you mentioned human waste, does any animal waste get treated in Mexico before it goes back in the rivers? Uh, important. Usually, the 76% considers agro, it's both for agriculture as for animal. I do not know the differentials between animals. I guess that it should be some, some percentage there. Waste is, is uh, very poorly handled. So it produces what's called diffuse pollution or non-point non source pollution, which is one of the main elements that I, I, I forgot to say here, but I had it here. Uh, that's causing that there is some type of percolation into the soil and it has an impact on water. Not only that, but also with pesticides and fertilizers. So there is, a, there is an issue that we still need much stronger regulation for this, uh, the management of the waste of the, of the cows, because they, it's an important source of uh, non-point uh, source solution for, uh, for, for the wider body. Let us thank our speaker, a tremendous speaker. And, uh, and if you would like to join our speaker. Incredible, really, wonderful. All right, still in ovation. And you may speak to him at this point if you'd like to stay a little bit longer. But we ask you also to stack the chairs if you're able to do that. Thank you very much. See you next week.